No, you need to tell the viewers just how difficult, time-consuming, detail analysis, background information that you have to do in order to play on that front. So, um, I mean, I think it, you know, it's fundamentally important. There's no substitute for this. I mean, uh, let me use some uh, federal provincial examples where uh, uh, PEI, you know, which has the uh, population of Leaside, uh, you know, plays a role <coughs> in federal provincial relations which is way beyond its, uh, its importance in the nation. And that's because it produces political leaders, sometimes, not all of them, but every now and then. I remember in the Charlottetown negotiations that I was involved in, Joe Giz, the Premier of, New, of PI, played an outsized role. He was just treated with respect and everybody believed him. He had, con they, you know, he, he had confidence uh, of his colleagues and he was crucial in getting a deal, which ultimately didn't matter, but, uh, but it wasn't because he was a big province or an important province, it was because he was an important person, back to personal relationships. The other thing in federal provincial relations, though, is um, doing your homework, coming in, knowing more than everybody else at the table. In uh, the international relations, Canada play, you know, this, the line of punching above our weight. Well, what does it mean to punch above our weight? It means that we do our homework we have smart people and knowledgeable people and experienced people who prepare, and they prepare deeply. And when we go to a meeting, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the COP22 that we just had in Marrakesh, I wasn't there. I am quite confident that Canada knew more about what we wanted to get out of this and what was necessary for other countries to get out of this than most other countries our size. And we could play a role that was important as an interpreter of the United States. Remember, this was just after the American election. <coughs> and we could play a role that other countries would find valuable. But because we had cred, your credibility is partly due to relationship, but fundamentally due to what you know. And if you outsmart the other guy, and I don't mean being clever, I mean outsmart them by knowing more, you will win. And I think you will make them winners as well. But the, it's really, really important to get uh, to do the preparation. I, I was negotiating with the provinces a transfer of $2 billion of uh, employment insurance money in the labor market development agreements, which is when I first uh, dealt closely with the prime minister. I was deputy minister of HRDC and uh, now ESDC. And what, what worked for us was that we had better analysts we, than the provinces. We had really smart people. Most of them had been former provincial officials uh, that had been banished by uh, provinces when they changed uh, a stripe of government, and a lot of them came to work <coughs> for the federal government. And then we could do the depth, deep analysis that allowed us to know more about their labor market than they knew. And that allowed us to speak intelligently about what was going on and make sure that we got um, the deal that we all wanted. Um, and it was particularly difficult with Quebec, uh, where they have a very professional public service and they know a lot. Ontario, very professional, uh, capable people. BC and Alberta, I would say. After that, it gets pretty thin. And the, that isn't a criticism of the people there. They're just spread very thinly. And so they have small public services, Saskatchewan, a million people, um, you know, we had 250,000 public servants. Uh, we could know a <coughs> lot about what went on in Saskatchewan, whereas Saskatchewan was more dependent on us for facts and details and analysis. So uh, the, the preparation you go into for a negotiation is fundamentally important to determine the outcome. Uh, when I was talking about um, going in on, uh, on Afghanistan uh, in, with the UK, um, I remember my, I had uh, a, a one-star general, a brigadier general, who was my military advisor, and I had four, uh, four stripe uh, colonels or ca naval captains. And these guys knew more about the British military than most Brits, uh, because they had all served with the British military <laughs> abroad. 
So my, in, in Afghanistan, so in Iraq, my guys would tell me, okay, watch, tomorrow you'll see that the Brits will take off their sunglasses. No wraparound sunglasses because that, they need the public to see their eyes. Tomorrow they'll take the helmets off and they'll put on berets and soft, they'll soften their present. And then they would, you know, two months later they'd say, watch, they're going to put their long arms away and only use sardons. They knew what the doctrine was, what the tactics were, what the strategy was for the other side. That knowledge, incredibly valuable. And not easy to do. Not easy to do. If it was easy, it would be done by everyone. It's not easy to do. It requires an investment up front. And that's, you know, thinking about negotiations, private sector negotiations. Government, same way. Exactly the same. So that the company, <coughs> you know, why do some lawyers get charged more than others? It's because they can deliver this kind of thing. Sometimes it's because they have a lot of juniors in the back room that are doing dog work. But it means that a company will know more going into a litigation or a negotiation for merger and acquisition or whatever. And that you want an asymmetry in the information, and you want to know more. I, I think you may have touched on this, but in terms of multi-party negotiations, I'm thinking, for instance, federal, provincial, or internationally, any particular protocols that you would have used in terms of your approach to these multi-party types of uh, negotiations? Right. <coughs> so the first, I, I, we've talked about respect. Um, the first thing is that you have to treat all of the players with respect. Uh, and when you get into a multi-party negotiation, it's very easy to pick out the three or four key players and only deal with them and ignore everybody else. That's a mistake because the others have to be party to the deal as well. Uh, there are ways of doing this that, you know, you do focus on the key players. You don't treat them all equally, but you give them the impression that they're being treated well. And I think it's really important, I, I used the example of PEI before, or I could use the example of Turkey in the OECD. When we were negotiating protocols in the OECD, you, you would never exclude Turkey. They always felt that they weren't like the other European countries, and you would insult them if you only dealt with the Western European countries. So there was always a way of bringing Turkey along that would help you with the Western European countries. So in those negotiations, you, you always want to treat people with respect. Just to come back to... That's a, that's a great insight, though, because I, I think quite often... You learn it by you know, having a brown beard that goes gray. No, but I, I, I think people would say in a multi-party negotiation as well, party A and party C and party D, they're, they're, they're quite influential here. We'll, we'll, we'll focus on them. And those other 10, well, we'll, we'll, we'll listen to them, but, you know, right. big mistake. Big mistake, and, <coughs> and that, you know, think about an M&A negotiation. In, if, if you've got uh, a whole bunch of, you have to think about what the other objectives are. And the other objectives of all the different people around the room, uh, and you might have a lot of people behind you as well, um, are uh, going to be different, and you need to find the way of aligning them. The other thing that, that you, you just triggered in me, David, is the, uh, the point about uh, the hardest negotiations are with your home team. Um, you know, you, there's a formality in the negotiations out here, but think about the Canadian delegation to Paris or Marrakesh in the uh, COP 21 or 22. Uh, that was composed of premiers, of uh, ministers of the environment from the provinces, of NGOs. The first time I met Elizabeth May was at the UN uh, when she was part of the Canadian delegation. Uh, when Sheila Copps was the Minister of the Environment and uh, Elizabeth was the president of the Sierra Club, an NGO. She was part of the Canadian delegations. We had N NGOs as part of our delegation. And uh, you, we would have a meeting every morning with our own delegation to sort out the differences across the delegation. And there were huge differences. And so you had the Provincial Premier of Forestry in Quebec and the Provincial Premier of Forestry in BC who had totally different objectives. And you had the NGOs trying to preserve the forests who had different objectives again. And the federal delegation was composed of all these differences. Negotiating with the international countries on this is easy. Cake. Easy. Cake. But the mere fact that Canadians, uh, who I think are revered in many parts of the world because of our abilities to negotiate, 
the mere fact of having those different interests in Canada in the same room mm -hmm. at the same time with the agenda, mm -hmm. whether they agree or disagree. Exactly. And some degree of good tone, civility, and listening skills can go a long way. So you mentioned listening skills. Um, I think How it, important is that? Well, yeah. <laughs> How important <coughs> is that, you ask? So one of the great listening skills I learned is you repeat the question. Uh, <laughs> but it, I, I think this is huge. And um, I've been rambling and talking, and uh, uh, you, you have very good listening skills. You're listening. Uh, I think that uh, this is one of the undervalued assets that people have. The best... Uh, I, I always remember... Um, the very first meeting of deputy ministers I attended, before I was a deputy, I was a very junior official in the Department of Finance. And I go to this massive boardroom, and it was on uh, northern pipelines, which are still yet to be built. And uh, we, it was deputy ministers all around the table, and I was in the back row watching. And Tommy Shoyama was the deputy minister of uh, finance at the time. And he never said a word. And everybody you know, laid out their positions, and they argued and back and forth, and it was up and down. And then the chair at, at the end of the meeting is just about to call the, the, the conclusion. And he looks down the table and he says, Tommy, what do you think? And the room became silent. And everybody realized they were going to hear words of wisdom from this wise man. And Tommy then laid out what the Department of Finance position was. And it, if he had put it in the t on the table at the beginning, it would have meant nothing would get done. But he came in strategically at the right time. He knew when to enter, when to play, how to play, not to be dogmatic. He didn't have to say a lot. He only had to speak at the right time. And so there's a lot of uh, cleverness in the way you play that. And a part of listening skills, I think, is genuinely showing that you've been listening. Talk to me about authority as a negotiator. You've been a negotiator on many files, <clears throat> internationally, domestically in terms of uh, dealing with deputy ministers and various institutions of the Government of Canada. Authority, where, mm. where does that come from? So I think uh, authority is a substitute <coughs> for negotiation. Um, you have fiat on the one side where the person with authority speaks and insists and demands and commands. And that works for a lot of things, and people will go away really pissed off and, uh, and then try to do something um, or get in the way. Or you negotiate with them, and you find an accommodation, and you make them want to do what you want them to do. And I think that, that, that in a way, authority is a, a substitute, not a complement. Now, put that aside for a moment, authority is, of course, uh, complementary uh, to the negotiations. I would sometimes, uh, I'll give you this little anecdote, uh, I, at one of my FedProv negotiations, I, uh, after the <coughs> ministers had left, uh, I chaired a deputy minister's table, and uh, one of the, we had worked this out, a de one of the deputies put on the table from the provinces, put on the table a proposal, and I said, that's terrific. I will assure that we go with that. And at the back of the room, this kid puts up his hand. He's a kid. And he comes to the table, and he says, I'm an intern with the Privy Council Office, and Mr. Cap doesn't have the authority to make that statement. Talk about authority. I knew how much authority I had. I knew what I could deliver. And this guy just undercut me. So I reached down his throat and pulled his heart out through his mouth. No, uh, it was close. Um, but that became a, a famous story that I've had people recount back to me about how I was caught out by this kid. Um, everybody in the room knew that I wouldn't have said it, because this comes back to credibility and confidence, that I wouldn't have said it if I couldn't deliver. And everybody, you know, and I, I giggled and laughed and said, don't worry, I can deliver. Uh, and I knew the limits of what I could deliver. I had the authority. When I was negotiating the transfer of that $2 billion to the provinces, it was $500 million for Quebec. And $500 million, you know, is small by $2 billion standard, but it's still a lot of candy. And, uh, and that was a long time ago, too, in the late 90s. So I uh, knew the limit. I had a negotiating mandate. I could not go beyond the mandate. 
but I had flexibility within the <coughs> mandate. Quebec knew that I had a mandate and that I could not go too far on some things, but I knew they had a mandate. So language became a big issue, right, about whether they would deliver services in English or not. Uh, but uh, they knew that I was not going to give in on that, and I knew they were not going to give in easily on this. And we had to do the dance, and we got to an agreement which was within my mandate. There was one moment when uh, I needed to go beyond my mandate on one negotiating element. And I recognized that I didn't have the authority uh, coming back to your word authority, and I went back to cabinet and I gave them the reason why it was the right thing to do and why we should give in on this on the condition that we get something else. And on balance, ministers uh, made the trade-off, uh, gave me a new mandate. I went back and found a way of getting something for our uh, flexibility. But the mandate is uh, very important, and you don't want a mandate that's too particular and too specific. The more specific your mandate, the less negotiating room you have. The big problem or question <coughs> is, what's, how do you start the negotiations knowing where you want to end up? And sometimes you have to go off to the side in order to come back to the middle. And finding the tactic that will take you that way, and sometimes it's a very obtuse strategy, of um, meeting yourself coming around the corner almost. Uh, and you need to think through how, I know where I want to get to, I know what some of the impediments are, where do I start and how do I give in? And how do they drag me back and what do I give in on? And for having that clearly in your mind, based on the analysis, based on the evidence, because you've done your homework, uh, you can be successful. Let's pivot over to the people side in this sense. Uh, how do you deal with, or how have you deal, dealt with difficult people? <laughs> I'd love to tell you, well, you fire them, but no, uh, the, sometimes they're on the other side of the table. Um, it can be that the person on the other side of the table is impossible to deal with. That, that does happen. It's rare, though. I, I wouldn't. You know, usually there's a way of, I mean, I'm a big fan, of, we talked before about personal relationships. Um, before negotiating, have dinner. <coughs> After negotiating, have dinner with the people you're negotiating with and don't talk about business. Have a personal relationship that will allow you to um, make progress. Sometimes you'll have difficult people on your own team as well. And then you need to know the limits of your mandate, know how far you can go, make sure that they are aligned, and think about how to align your objectives with them. But at some point, you've got to recognize that some difficult people are just impossible to deal with. Um, and, you know, I, look, <coughs> I don't look forward to watching uh, Xi Jinping and Donald Trump uh, negotiating. This is not going to be pretty. No, I don't think so. Tell me about the person that is deceptive. There's one thing to have a difficult person, but <laughs> what happens if the person is deceptive? Yeah, I, so I talked about confidence and trust. Um, if you can't trust the person, it's very hard to negotiate with them. Um, you need everything written down. You need everything locked in. Uh, if, if you don't believe, if the person is dissembling and uh, avoiding you, uh, not telling you the truth, you're, you, that's very, very difficult. That's worse than uh, somebody who's just difficult to deal with. Difficult I can deal with. Lack of trust, almost impossible. Uh, now, there are degrees. This isn't a binary choice. It's not like some people are trustworthy and others aren't. That's my next question, is trust. Okay, well... What, what do you look for in terms of the other side being trustworthy? And then what do you do to exhibit a trustworthy behavior? So, I mean, it, it's truthfulness to, uh, at the start. It's openness. I think, you know, I've always felt that I would build trust by being <coughs> more candid and open. And by me saying, look... I've got some latitude on this point. I can negotiate on this much more easily than I can here. Because on this one, and you know, I'm essentially disclosing my negotiating strategy, on this one, I'm going to have great difficulty. 
So don't expect me to give in on here. Now, at first they'll say, oh yeah, you're just, you know, that's a tactic in this. But I found that it was always better to sort of set that out at the beginning, give them a sense of where you could accommodate. Welcome to the real world. Yeah, and, and that's really important to build trust. They have to, you know, it, they, they may doubt you at first, but eventually they'll realize, gee, I've heard this story now 17 times. It must be true, or maybe it's true. So the openness, I think, is an important factor. I think you can also build trust by demonstrating that you've told the truth. So at various times, um, you can demonstrate honesty that will earn you credibility with the other side. And you need to find a way of... Could you have an example? <coughs> Pardon me. Um, sometimes it's as simple as doing a favor for the other side. Um, you know, and that comes back to uh, dinner. I mean, the, my point about dinner is, is a, a funny one because um, I don't really mean dinner. I mean exchanging as human beings. When I'm in the room, I'm a negotiator. But when I'm at dinner, I'm just a person. <laughs> and the thing that I've always found most valuable in building trust and building relationships is talking about your family. And uh, so you can do that at dinner. You could do that at dinner much more easily. And, and then that carries over in an understanding of the other guy. Uh, I'll tell you my, my interview for the clerk's job. I get a call, I remember this clearly, it was December 3rd, <coughs> 1998, and it's from Bruce Hartley, the Prime Minister, then Prime Minister's uh, Chief of Staff, and he says, uh, Mel, the Prime Minister would like to have uh, lunch with you at 24 Sussex today. And I responded, sorry, I'm busy. No, you don't say you're busy to the Prime Minister. So you, I go along and um, go into uh, the salon at uh, 24 Sussex, and I'm sitting in, uh, on a sofa, and the Prime Minister's facing me on a sofa. And um, we spend about 40 minutes over a beer talking about our families. He wanted to know about my parents, my grandparents, and when they came to Canada, and my children, and all of this. And he was telling me about his children, and his parents and his brothers and sisters, and, and we go to dinner and we, or lunch, and we eat lunch, and still talking about our family. I learned a lot from this guy. This was his interview technique. He didn't want to know, could I do the job? He, I was a deputy minister, a senior deputy minister. He'd seen me in things. He knew I could do the job. He wanted to know what kind of man I was. He wanted to know what kind of person I was. Can I work with this guy? And that's what you want to do in a negotiation, in a sense. So at the end, over dessert, I said to the Prime Minister, well, look, Prime Minister, I mean, you know, what do you want from uh, the person who's going to be uh, your next clerk? Oh, yeah, I want somebody who'll do what I tell them. And I said, well, Prime Minister, the job's more than that. I mean, I, my, here's what I think the job is, and I told him. And, you know, give you my best advice. And, uh, oh, yeah, 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 I agree. Uh, but, but by then, he knew what kind of person I was. And... I figured it didn't matter what I said about the job because he wanted to know, is this somebody I can work with? And in a sense, that's what you want to do in the negotiations. You want to know, is this somebody I can get a deal with or not? And sometimes, you know, over dinner, you'll find out this person is making stuff up. He's not trustworthy. I'm not, you know, I'm not I'm not comfortable. Trust I'm yeah. not comfortable. But it is a great icebreaker, isn't it? Totally. Yeah. I mean, you find out so much about an individual just by drinking the coffee or drinking the soup together. My favorite line for politicians is always, and I learned this from uh, a Mulroney cabinet minister. Uh, we, it was the first time he was in cabinet, and he comes to, we, we, and the deputy minister organizes a dinner with the, as I was assistant deputy minister, uh, with the de assistant deputy ministers and the new minister and his chief of staff. And uh, the first question I asked was, so minister, why did you get into politics? And we were gone for the whole evening as he told his story, his story about why he entered politics. And I just found that there are, there's an analog for every person. You've got to find the right question for the right person. But that was one for politicians that really worked. I, someday we'll ta have that conversation. <laughs> In terms of ground rules that you have, i.e. an agenda, do you share that agenda with the other side in advance? Do you spring it on them? Do you work together on the agenda, whether it's FedProv, whether it's an international? You're walking in to see uh, an ambassador of another country. Uh, is this all new to him, or 
or her, or is it talked about in advance so that you know what you're talking about? I, I think it's fundamentally um, a tactical question of how you play it. Uh, the answer is I think you do make them, let them know what your, uh, your, your strategy is, but, uh, or what your objectives are, how you're going to play this, but you do it in an iterative process. I don't think you say, you know, here's my strategy. Uh, you don't tell them this. But I think you do disclose it uh, step by step in the process. And that's part of building trust. And so if you just open yourself on that, you're <coughs> probably going to be taken advantage of. Whereas if you let it out slowly, uh, you're going to build trust. You're going to align those objectives. Uh, I think that uh, the, this applies in international negotiations um, and in life in general. I mean, when you're uh, buying a car, uh, you know, you, you're negotiating from the, when you walk in the door and uh, you've got to have, um, you've got to know what's important and you have to make it clear. I, I mean, uh, I just bought a car recently and, ah. and, and the guy figured me out which was what I wanted. I wanted him to know that I wasn't playing a game and I didn't want to spend all day at this. Uh, and I wanted him to understand what my requirements were. I need this, I've got a small garage, I need something that'll fold the mirrors in and you know, like that kind of thing. And once he got it, he stopped trying to sell me and he started to explain what the car had. And that, it was very valuable to disclose in that process. Well, Mel, our time is just about up. But I, I do have one final question for you. This is the Colombo. Uh, yes, it is. This is where we're going to get everything right. in one. But what would you advise after many years of varied experiences, particularly at the high end, uh, to young graduates, say, of a, a Ryerson University who are looking for a job, may have a job, want to start a career? Mm -hmm. What are some of the do's and don'ts from what you've seen that could be helpful to them in terms of their particular careers? The first thing I think is that understanding that what you learned in university is fundamentally important, um, in particular in the business school, but not only in the business school. Uh, and I, I, we just had a, a Christmas party for our graduates and our alumni and our current students. And when I asked the, the alumni who are out there now, you know, are you using what we taught you? They pause and they think for a minute, I, I guess we are, you know, but they, it's not the things they learned, right? It's not what they got out of the textbook, but it's the way of thinking that they've learned. And so what I, I would recommend to everybody is to try to understand what it is that you really learned at university. And it, it isn't what, you know, how to invert matrices or how to do calculus. Uh, it's how to have a structured and disciplined way of thinking of how to analyze problems, of how to bring evidence to problem solving. Those are the things that a good university teaches, and Ryerson is a good university, and they're getting that here, but how they use it when they go out isn't always obvious. And many people will leave here thinking, well, you know, I, um, I really didn't learn a lot of practical things. And I guess that uh, that is that may be true, and it's not what a university is for. You know, go to a community college. Uh, Ryerson Polytechnic was the place you should have been uh, 30 or 40 years ago uh, if you wanted to learn practical. If you want to learn how to think, Ryerson University is the place to learn. And then use that when you go out. Well, look, on behalf of the Ted Rogers School of Management, uh, the faculty and the students, let me express to you our appreciation for joining us and for some great insights into negotiations and advocacy and uh, how best to, to pursue a career. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure.